So I am going to talk um, a bit more broadly about um, what it means to design for the future of aging. And I even hesitated to put the word aging in this title because actually the more and more I talk about this topic, the more and more I believe that that word should be banned from this topic. Um, so I think you're all here because you have a lot of big questions. Um, you're all interested from a business perspective. In this um, area, we have an aging population in the developing world, um, not only in the US, but around the world, which I'm sure you're all aware of. And so there's big questions um, that come up, um, things like, you know, how do we own longevity by owning lifestyle? Or things like, how do we move away from based in care? As Katie said, it's not about frail and institutional. Um, we have to change the paradigm here and move into something that's much more aspirational, for my benefit, if for no one else's. <laughs> um, and how do we create more meaningful and rewarding experiences for our customers, our users, the people that we're designing for? Um, and how can we innovate? Are there new business models, new partnerships? You're all here to network, um, you know, that will attract the next generation, my generation of baby boomers. So design thinking um, is a really powerful tool um, to answer a lot of these kinds of questions. And it's probably up in that category of, of sort of buzzwords right now in some respects. Um, but I think from IDO's perspective, we firmly believe that everyone can be a designer. Um, it doesn't require a design degree from anywhere, um, that you're all capable of being designers. Um, and that design thinking is really an orientation um, and a belief that better things are possible and that you can actually make it happen. Um, so the key point, I think, around design thinking that um, if you remember nothing else from what I say is that in order to create that kind of positive impact, you really have to take a human-centered approach. Um, and that human-centered approach um, is really what's going to get you to innovation. So uh, this little diagram is something that we use a lot with our clients to talk about the way we approach our work, but I think it's applicable to everyone. And that's that you start with people. If what you're creating isn't desirable, doesn't have a value proposition for the people that you're designing for, you might as well stop right there. Um, and I have seen a lot of startups come to IDEO and say, I've got this amazing technology. And, you know, it's going to answer everything. And the reality is you can't start with the technology. Um, you really have to start with a need. You have to understand people's core values. Um, so that's why people are first. So the desirability. But you do also have to think about the business and the viability. Um, and really understand that, not only from the perspective of your own business, but what's the market out there? And is this answering a value proposition for the user, for the marketplace? And then there's the feasibility. And more and more as technology um, advances, feasibility is less of an issue. Um, the only time I think that it becomes really challenging for us is in the world of medical products quite often. Um, we're asked to sort of stretch the envelope and create new things, um, develop new um, patents to think about things really outside of the box um, in a way that really pushes that edge of technology. But I think more and more what's going on in the world of the intranet and um, devices and all of these kinds of things, you know, there's more out there than you could possibly use. The question is, where is its value and how to apply it? So, how to think like a designer. So, also number one and most important, don't forget, it's about being empathic, back to this human center. You have to put people first. Um, what do users need and want? And you have to imagine it from multiple perspectives. We talk about caring for people, we talk about caregivers, we talk about this holistic community of people that are involved in this. So multiple perspectives is really critical. And you really have to walk in their shoes. And you know, it's everything from an empathy suit to um, 
these pictures illustrate something. We do a lot of healthcare work, and one of our clients asked us to have, help them improve the patient experience. So we had someone be a patient for a day, a mock patient, and they took a video camera, and they were the video camera was their eyes for a day. And when they finished their day, more than 75% of what that video camera saw was the ceiling. So I don't think the healthcare folks were thinking about the ceiling when they were thinking about how to improve the patient experience. But in point of fact, it was really critical. So, you know, really walking in the shoes of who you're designing for um, is, is just an imperative, or you're going to get it wrong from the very beginning. Um, it's about making connections. Um, this image illustrates um, something we call analogous research. So if you're designing um, a surgery suite, suite for a team of surgeons, um, perhaps going to NASCAR and looking how a pit crew works could inform the way you think about that design. Um, you really need to open yourself up to a lot of other potential um, sources of inspiration. Uh, when we do a lot of healthcare work, we look at hospitality because healthcare is now in a competitive market. Um, they need to provide things. People have a sort of comfort and um, an acceptance of these kinds of things. So their expectation is that they translate across these industries. Um, so really making those connections and stretching yourself outside of your box. It's also about being optimistic. Um, it's not about one great idea. It's about having many ideas and really testing a hypothesis in multiple ways. It's about, you know, really looking at alternatives and opening yourself up um, because there is no silver bullet, quite honestly. Um, there's multiple ways to solve a problem, um, but I think starting with a lot of ideas will get you a lot further than just hoping for one. And it's also about being incredibly collaborative. Even if you're a small startup, um, events like this, creating a network, um, co-creating with your customers. Um, at IDEO, we have what we call unfocus groups because <laughs> we don't, for our purposes, because we do so much qualitative research, focus groups don't really serve a purpose for us. They have a purpose in the world, but not for us. And um, so we'll invite actually a spectrum of people who might be on the extreme end of who we're designing for as well as that sort of actual um, target customer and we'll ask them to co-create with us because they're incredibly inspiring and they can really jumpstart um, concepts as a result of that so um, don't be shy uh, and it's also about being experimental um, I hear a lot of people talk about oh I have a prototype and I'm going to take it around and show it to everyone um, you have to get past that precious prototype you have to prototype a lot of things and do it early and iterate and really try a lot of things and you've got to fail a lot because that's the only way as a designer you're going to get to what is probably a much better solution. Um, we even talk about making what we call um, sacrificial prototypes. When we first go out to talk to people it's quite hard to talk to them about some of the things, it's like giving someone a white piece of paper and telling them to draw. It's kind of intimidating and people don't know how to respond. So we actually create things that are wrong just to get them to talk, just to get them to have something to respond to. Um, and we have no intention of ever taking that prototype anywhere beyond that interview, but it is a way to elicit dialogue and get response. So be experimental, don't make things precious, um, and be very, very iterative. So five things, um, being empathic, making those connections, being optimistic, being collaborative, and being experimental. Can we all do that? Yeah? All right. So now you're a design thinker. Um, so design thinkers need tools. No good designer would be without their tools. <laughs> so everyone needs a process. This this is an illustration of IDEO's process, although again, I will qualify that this is a really bad diagram. It's a bad visual because in point of fact, it's not linear. In order to explain it, it looks linear. But the reality is that any step of the way in here, there would probably be a circle drawn because 
to my previous point about prototyping and being iterative, it's really important. As you learn, as you go, you go back and you reevaluate some of the things you've done. What is important to know is that in your process, you're going to move from being very, um, what I'll call concrete. You're going to go out to talk to real people. You're going to get real information. But eventually, you're going to have to come up with a, a framework or some insights or some way of getting your hands around, your head around, you know, what is it you're actually trying to design for. And once you do that, then you're going to go back into the concrete and you're going to actually create stuff and you're going to try things. Um, so we, in a simple way, like to talk about it. Um, you go out and you get inspired and you're diligent about that. There's a rigor to it. Um, and then you come back and from that inspiration, you bring yourself to a point of actually ideating, of starting to think conceptually about what could the solution be. And eventually you're going to start eliminating and sort of honing in on something that you want to start to implement or create. And that's a pretty simple process, pretty straightforward. Um, but you can't really miss any of the steps along the way. There's no short circuit. It's very easy quite often to say, I've been inspired, I saw something, I got this great idea, and you jump right away to implementing. Not a good plan. Um, you also need a fairly holistic perspective. Um, what I was saying about, you need to look not only at your end user, but you need to look what's going on out in the culture, in the market. Um, what are the trends? What are the other things out there that you need to be aware of um, as you go through this decision process? So having this perspective, and in many cases, there's some great methods that you can use um, to actually look out in the world and also look in. Um, sometimes it really requires looking at yourself and the way you're organized and how you think about things and adapting accordingly. And it's working every, every degree of from the individual all the way up to the culture and the trends that are going on. One of the complaints I had as a design student in later life was the fact that nobody ever, ever taught me about demographics. I had to find that out on my own. If some, hmm? Two more minutes? Great. Um, a tool that we like to use that helps you get to a point of deciding what you want to design are called how might we's. So they're a question that marries the needs that you've discovered and the market opportunities that you imagine to be out there from the way you look at the business. And these are meant to be generative. This is what you're going to brainstorm your ideas from. Um, so you have to be kind of careful. They can't be too detailed and they can't be too broad. So a couple of examples. You know, imagine yourself trying to brainstorm around these. And if you can, then they're good. And if you can't or it's too detailed and you can't come up with a lot of ideas, then perhaps um, you need to change them a bit. So for example, how might we support multi-generational communities? There's a lot of ways to do that. Um, or how might we enable active health and elders? Um, but it's a great tool to use to help you begin to understand how to brainstorm and what concepts really should go forward. And then once you're creating, you know, as I said, get feedback and get it often and get fast and co-create and do everything you can to learn from this process as you're going through it. Um, and last thought, if you're not failing, you're not pushing hard enough. So thank you. We can take some questions. Um, and we have a time for a couple questions if anybody has one. For Gretchen? What do you mean by optimistic? I mean, how does that play? I don't mean pessimistic, <laughs> but I mean, as part of your design thing. That you're always going to win, that you're always going to work? Or? No, I think being optimistic in your approach. Um, that, you know, there's multiple ways to solve a problem. And, you know, sort of opening yourself up in that optimism around them. Uh, I think. The opposite of it is when people start to narrow and focus too early and, and sort of eliminate a lot of things um, and, and start to be quite judgmental uh, as opposed to, you know, keeping your opinion, opinions and your mind open about things. It's that kind of optimism. <coughs> Let's go. Um, 
Micah, and then Jacqueline. Okay. Micah. Um, Nisha. Nisha. So I hear, uh, I know that IDEO does this like power user, right? So you look like who are very, very early adoptive, early adopters, almost like innovative adopters. And I was just wondering, like in the aging community, like if you guys have done uh, work in the aging community before, like who do you view as sort of your power user in a, in an aging context? I'm I'm not sure I understand the term power user. I mean, we look we usually like extreme users. Like for yeah. example, if you're going to look at the quantified self space, you look at someone who is like log, life logging everything. Yes. And so, if you were to do a study on you know the impact of like a uh, the, the architecture of a community, of an aging community, like, I guess, how would you identify power users in a, in a geriatric context? Like, is it the oldest person? Is it the greatest person? Um, I, I think... I think we would cut it in a couple of spectrums. We might cut it across, you know, physical abilities. We might cut it across mental abilities. We might cut it across just the spectrum of people that exist in that ecosystem of people. Um, and actually people who absolutely refuse to live in those contexts and people who are extremely happy in them. So I think there's many ways you can cut it. Um, and depending upon what you're designing, you'll decide how, how to pull that apart in a research plan or whatever you're, you're developing for it. Um, that's such an interesting approach that you take uh, to design. Uh, uh, can you describe a challenging um, project that you had that you took through this approach and what the innovative outcomes was? And, and, and specific perhaps to our space. Sure. Um, Let's see, what one can I talk about? That's always the problem. Um, we did some work with um, Kisco, which is a company that uh, own senior housing, um, particularly here on the West Coast. They're not one of the big players like Escaton, but you know they they have an interesting um, sort of uh, very charismatic and uh, pushing outside of the box um, type of leadership within their organization. And so they came to IDEO and said, "Look, we know the space has to change." <laughs> You know, we have a lot of physical property. It's very expensive to change physical property. And by the time we get around to changing it, it's usually out of date. So help us understand how we can respond to um, the aging marketplace and be more attractive to them. Um, so we did a lot of extensive spending time actually living there. Um, Part of the team spent a great deal of time there understanding what it was like to be in one of their communities. They went to multiple communities. They went to their competition. You know, they, they did a lot of um, looking in, looking out, talked to a lot of people within the organization there to understand just what was the ecosystem, what was going on there. And um, came up with three concepts. And what really sort of everything boiled down to was really understanding the concept of community. It wasn't about aging, it was really about understanding community. And what did it mean to create a community? And what were the needs of the people living in that community? And so um, the kinds of concepts that came out of it that Kisco is in the process of taking forward, because many of them take a long period of time, um, was we learned that there's a lot of social currency around food. But in most of these facilities, um, food is served to you you don't interact with that experience in any way other than being served. And that's not the real world for most people and it's quite disempowering in many ways. And so we help them understand how to turn food into social currency and to help create community by opening up the kitchens and creating spaces where the people who were there could actually co-create a dinner you know, with the staff or teach someone else how to cook something or go and make a snack for themselves because before everything was locked up and behind, you know, it just didn't make sense. So that was a physical way of manifesting it. The other thing we discovered is that many of these folks in this community were actually still very actively engaged in some form of business and the more technology capable they were, the more likely they were to have all sorts of um, kind of side consulting or, you know, other opportunities to continue working in sort of on their own terms. 
but nobody thinks about career path when you're in <laughs> an elder care center. And so they created a program actually for um, career development and um, you know, really started to approach it completely differently, knowing that the only way that they were going to grow their community, which meant they had to get younger people to come and, and stay there, was to actually begin to think differently and outside of the box. And so we created a series of concepts. They picked three. And you know, they're now moving them forward through, um, through the organization.